Hey, Cashville community, this is Tyler. Before we start this episode, I want to let you in on a little secret. Have you ever wondered about what it'd be like to, I don't know, maybe just pack up everything in your house, move into an RV, and then, oh heck, I don't know, travel the country while a video camera follows you? Well, guess what? Jill and I did just that. We're calling it the Cashflow Roadshow. That's our new YouTube channel. If you want to follow us and keep an eye on what we're doing, where we're at, the dumb stuff I'm probably doing, and the new people that we get to meet, you can do that by going to cashflowroadshow.com. That's cashflowroadshow.com. That'll take you directly to our YouTube channel. Smash that subscribe button. That will notify you when a new video comes out. Join us. We look forward to hearing from you. Let's get started with the episode. Welcome to the Cashflow Guys Podcast. That's right. You heard the man. This is the Cashflow Guys podcast. I am Tyler Chef, your host, and we are back for another week of learning how to earn. And this week, we're going to talk about some listener questions that came in. And one of them, we'll see how far we get it. I want to drag you guys out for hours and hours, but we're going to start off by talking about investing long distance. And for that, in this case, uh, it talks about turnkey rentals. So Crystal, one of our listeners, or one of my listeners said... um, Send a question in via email. And guys, if you have questions you want answered, you don't maybe have the time or you don't want to get on the phone and talk about it necessarily, but you just need an answer to your question in this form, I can reply back by via podcast episode. Send an email to info at cashflowguys.com, info at cashflowguys.com. I want to give a shout out to all the folks that have reached out and got on the phone with me. Hopefully we've given you some value. At least you said you we got you got some value out of it. Hope to get your point in the right direction so you can take steps towards getting financially free. Um, the, to those, and I just want well, to mention this real quick. I'm not going to belabor the point, but I've had a rash of people recently that have booked a slot on my calendar um, and then not shown up for the call, which is disheartening. I got to tell you. So, when that happens, and I understand sometimes life happens, life gets in the way, but understand that the I my job is to help other people, right? Is to help people. I, I help the marketplace, and by doing so, the marketplace gives back to me. Well, here's the problem. When you take the time in, to book time on my calendar, it blocks me from doing anything else during that time frame, right? And I've got parameters set up, which means that you can't, nobody else can book within a couple hours before and a couple hours after. So the other day, I had three listeners in a row, three people in a row booked time on my calendar for a free slot on my calendar that did not show up to the call, which means I lost an entire day because the way the calendar set up is I have time. I set up time before to prepare for the call and then time afterwards to take notes, debrief, things like that. Sometimes I'll create content based on the conversations that we have, things like that. Bottom line is this is a something that I do to give back to the listeners. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed that folks would, in this case, three people would take the time to book an appointment, block my calendar, time away from my income generating activities, time away from um, not be, me not being able to earn revenue during those times because those are not sales calls, guys. I don't sell anything. I don't sell coaching or courses or any of that stuff. During those calls, that's not what it's about. It's me giving my time to help you get unstuck. So that said, when these guys book this time and they don't show, that time is now wasted time. That's time I can't get back. That's time away from my family. That's time away from the other folks that are going to take action and will apply and get themselves out of their own way. So I ask you this. If you do book an appointment with me, and normally I would never mention this because it's very far and few between it happens, but the other day, like I said, three times in a row it happened, I lost an entire day. Okay, I could be doing other things, helping other people that time. So what happens is uh, in the future, if you book an appointment on my calendar and you can't make it, simply drop me an email, send me a text message, send smoke signals. I don't care. But let me know in advance that you can't make it. I understand this thing. Things happen sometimes. But when they don't even have the courtesy to reach out to tell me, hey, I can't make it. I'm sorry. This didn't work. And by the way, when you book a slot of my appointment, it sends you a text message reminder. It sends you an email reminders. There's no way you could forget the call. It's not possible. The system is designed to make sure that people show up. And 99% of the time, people do show up. Uh, But in this case, I guess I had a bad day where three people did not show up. Uh, did a little research on them on Facebook, young guys kind of, I guess they think they're movers and shakers or whatever. And they don't value the time of others. Folks, if you're going to be a real estate investor. You better make sure that you get in line with valuing the time of other people in your market, in your space, because if people identify you as somebody who likes to waste other people's time, they're going to shut you out. Okay. They're absolutely going to shut you out. Now those people lost an opportunity 
to receive value into their life absolutely free of charge. I could have given them advice that could have helped them change their life position for the better. They could have learned something new. It's unfortunate, but that's the reality in today's society. A lot of folks don't really appreciate the time of others. That's It's sad, but true. And speaking about investing in time and, and things like that, let's talk about uh, Crystal is one of our listeners. Crystal reached out and said, I've developed an interest in real estate in the past few months. She sent this over via email. Speaking of which, if you want to get your questions answered on the air, you want me to make an episode about your question, drop an email to info, I-N-F-O, at cashflowguys.com, info at cashflowguys.com. Those questions come to me and the team. We'll go through them and we'll, we'll pick out ones that uh, and, and put together podcast episodes just like we're doing now in the last couple episodes for you guys to help you get the answers you need and get you going in the right direction. That's info at cashflowguys.com. So Crystal goes on to say, I haven't made my first investment yet since I'm still educating myself with books, podcasts, and developing a strategy that works for me. Okay, I understand that, provided it doesn't take too long. So the next question is really, what? how, how long is too long? Well, really it depends on you, but if you're, you're taking a year to figure out your investor identity, you're not doing it right. If, you're, if it's taking you that long to decide what you're going to invest in, then you're either not educating yourself effectively Therefore, or, you know, maybe not completely, or you're not talking to enough people. You got to get on the phone with people or get in front of people, talk to people, get a book, a call with me, but make sure you show up and see if we can get you pointed in the right direction and what you might want to invest in. Okay. One thing that's come up a lot, particularly as a long distance investor is the idea of turnkey investments. What are your thoughts on turnkey companies? Any insight would be greatly appreciated. So first I want to start out with saying, why would you, why do you want to be a lot? There's nothing with being, nothing wrong with being a long-term investor, but why is being a long-term investor a thing for you? Why does that need to be the case? And if you live in maybe California or New York city and you're just starting out you don't have a whole lot of capital and maybe you don't have much of a network, then maybe I would get it, you know, going, doing a long-term type of scenario. But what, why haven't you explored opportunity in your own market? Okay. That's the first question I'd have for you. What what about your current market is is not any good for you, okay? Now, for me, what I found is that um, I invested in two markets. I invest in Memphis, Tennessee, and in Tampa, Florida, not to, excluding the note business. We got notes in Ohio and a couple other states. Anyway, um, for us, initially, when I was getting started, I didn't have a lot of deal flow. So for me, the perception of going to a different market I was, I was kidding myself to think that I had more opportunities in another market like Memphis and it's compared to my own home market of Tampa, which was completely false, it turned out. It's just that I wasn't generating enough leads to keep my pipeline full in my own back door. And then I thought, okay, well, if, I can't, if I'm not generating enough leads on my own back door, how's that going to ha- What's going to change that? Okay, what's going to go on? in Memphis, that's going to be any different. And the answer wound up being that somebody in Memphis, folks in Memphis are there to, in some cases to prey on out of town investors. They are an area, a market that, you know, they're catered to the out of town investor, so to speak. There's lots of investment opportunity there. Lots of sharks in the water. That said, if you're going to deal with a turnkey provider, in this case, getting into turnkey investments, Turnkey investments are what they are. Don't kid yourself into thinking that you are going to get or nor are you entitled to all the profits of in a turnkey investment. By by that, I mean you got to leave some meat on the bone for the people that are doing the turnkey work. They've developed a pipeline. They've learned how to generate leads. They've secured local financing and funding to pay for the purchase and renovations of these properties. They've done the renovations of these properties. They've sourced the tenants. They've handled the marketing. So they have a lot of upfront expense. So understand that these turnkey providers deserve to make a profit. Okay, got to go in with that mindset. That said, as a buyer of a turnkey property, <laughs> you too need to make a profit and deserve to make a profit. So if presented a deal and you vetted the deal properly and there's just not enough profit in it for you, don't be hating on them. Don't do the deal. It's that simple. Because there are a lot of turnkey providers out there that take a bigger piece of, of the pie than maybe they should Okay. Now you could say, well, how much is too much? Well, that really depends on you. For me, you know, if, if you're going to sell me a two bedroom, one bath house in Memphis as a turnkey property that makes a hundred bucks a month in cash flow, I'm going to say, no, thank you. That's an absolute waste of my time because I'm going to wind up writing a check to that property at the end of the month. I can tell you, I can tell you that at some point because something's going to happen. 
That said, when you get into turnkey providers, vet them, okay? Now, for me, I'm a big believer. I like Terry Kerr over at Mid-South Homebuyers. Um, Mid-South Homebuyers is in Memphis, and I know Memphis very well. I know all the players in Memphis and, you know, the good, the bad, the indifferent. I can tell you that Mid-South Homebuyers it does a great job in the turnkey space. That said, do they do this for free? No. Do they give amazing deals every time? Well, no, because, like I said, they deserve to make a profit. Do they give good deals? I believe so. I think you can get a steady predictable return if you go with somebody like Mid-South Homebuyers that does it on a big number, on a big scale, right? So they got lots of feelers out there. So they're doing really good on the acquisitions piece. They've got their renovations under control. They're squared away. They've been doing this in the space in Memphis for a long time. They know everybody. They know what's going on. So for me, I would be all over them. And, and frankly, if you buy something from Mid-South, tell them that uh, cash flow guy sent you. The quickest way to get to them, you can go to cashflowguys.com forward slash turnkey, and that will get you directly over to their website. Uh, Terry Kerr is the contact over there. There's a couple different people that work in there, but they got a great team, great folks. Uh, Tell them the Cashflow Guys sent you, and they will will hook me up with a referral fee, which is awesome. But again, I'm not recommending them because they give referral fees. Most turnkey providers pay referral fees. That said, I recommend them because they keep my good reputation intact, because they treat people right. I've never heard to the contrary. So give them a shot. That's uh, cashflowguys.com forward slash turnkey. I would say this, with any turnkey provider, Mid-South or otherwise, go visit their operation in person. You're thinking, well, Tyler, I don't want to go there. That defeats the purpose of being long distance. Here's the thing. Do not invest in a, in a property or an asset long-term, or any type of asset, without going to physically see it. I, I've done this, and it was a big mistake. Go see it. I don't care if it's turnkey. I don't care how good the photographs are. I want you to go meet the turnkey providers. I want you to see what their offices look like, what their systems are like. I want you to shake hands with the maintenance guy that's going to be working on your property. I want you to meet the person that's doing your cash flow breakdown at the end of the month, the person who's deducting expenses, the person who's answering the phones for the tenants. I want you to meet these people, and I want you to be comfortable with who these people are and how they're treating your clients. And by your clients, we're talking about the tenants. Because here's the thing, there's a lot of turnkey providers that are good at one part of the turnkey element, but not necessarily good at all of it, or maybe they, they're terrible at all of it. But keep this in mind, these, are, these folks are going to be buying, renovating, and then selling you a house, usually with a tenant in place or plans to have one in place and management. That said, don't get sucked into, oh, it's a great turn, they got a great deal, and the paperwork looks great, and the transaction, it was easy to buy but then the management is a train wreck. You don't want that. You also don't want to get your cash flow statement, your profit statement at the end of the month and and it actually be an invoice or a bill. Because what happens is a lot of these turnkey companies will nickel dime you to death, okay? So how do we find out about these people? Well, instead in in addition to visiting them in person, I believe you should surprise inspection visit them in person um, and attend training and webinars. If they put on training and webinars, watch them. Immerse yourself in what they're doing. Immerse yourself in what they're teaching. Learn how they do their business. Because here's the thing. If you want somebody long enough who's a shyster, eventually they're going to show their color, their colors. You know, I was walking, watching a peacock walk around the other day, and the peacock didn't have his feathers spread out at all. So he looked like a pretty cool bird, colored and whatnot, and different colors, and that's all fine and dandy. But I waited for it and waited and waited and waited, and eventually he spread his feathers and therefore showed his beauty. So... Same thing here on the other side. You got to spend some time focused on, on researching them, okay? And if it looks too good to be true, it absolutely is. Now, I'm not saying that all turnkey providers are bad. In, in fact, I, I would don't think that's true. I think that a majority of, of turnkey providers out there probably mean very well. It's just that they may not be experts in all facets. So the first thing I look at is longevity. How long have they been in business? The guy's been a turnkey provider for 12 months. Well, I don't know about that. So I'd want to ask some more some more questions. Did they recently work for another turnkey provider and, and wound up breaking out on their own? That's admirable, admirable. I can handle that. But ask these these questions. Well, why? I see you've been in business for a year. Tell me about your background. You want to in, interview them extensively. You want to make sure that you're up to speed with everything that they're doing and how they do it. Okay. So that said, call local RIA, RIA, RIA's, uh, RIA meetings, real estate investment associations. Name drop them. Hey, you know, go up to Memphis and call the RIA's on the phone 
or go on Meetup and find the Rios and say, hey, ever heard of uh, Mid-South Home Buyers? And if you get a giggle snort, that probably tells you that you may want to ask a few more people. And if you continue to get those giggle snorts, then maybe you wouldn't want to use that, that provider anymore. However, when you call, because I've done this work, when you call the Mid-South Home Buyer, you call and start asking questions about Mid-South, you're going to get great response. Okay, people give a good, they, they get real good feedback. Okay, so title companies are another good resource. Ask the title companies uh, in the area. And there's there's always a lot of them, but find the title companies that do the biggest amount of volume, and you do that by asking people at RIA meetings and things like that, doing some research online. Call them up the phone, say, hey, you know, I'm thinking of buying some properties from Mid South Home Buyers. Any feedback on them, good, better, and different. A lot of them probably won't tell you much, especially if they're a customer uh, of the title company, but Usually, if, a, if something is going to go wrong in a transaction repeatedly, there's a systems issue, the title companies are usually going to be a repository of that information because they deal with them every day. Okay, Forget about testimonials you see on their website because here's the thing. Who in their right mind would put a bad testimonial on their own website? So when you listen to a testimonial, all you're going to get is the, somebody else's fact that, of their experience that may or may not have been compensated. Okay, So... Why would you put any emphasis on that? Not to say anything wrong with testimonials. We have testimonials for the mailbox money system because testimonials to some folks are very important. However, when dealing with a turnkey provider, I suggest you skip over the testimonials and basically go searching for your own information. You want to be comfortable with them. Next, I would say do all the math. Make sure the expenses are counted for all of the expenses, not just the ones that fit into the cute little boxes on their website. I mean all the expenses. Okay. That to, to me, that means property insurance, and you make sure that you go call an insurance provider and find out what it costs to do insurance, to get insurance on that particular property, that particular address. A lot of times they'll do what they call a pro forma, which is uh, Latin for I'm guessing. A pro forma basically says what they think the insurance will go for or what it should go for, the average insurance for this zip code, which I'm going to tell you is just flat out guessing. That's all it is. They're guessing. Because there's no, the zip code itself has no bearing on the cost of the insurance. Is it a shingle roof? Is it a metal roof? Is it a two-story, a one-story, a duplex, a triplex, a single family? Whatever it may be, you're going to need to pick up the phone and get on the phone with an insurance company and verify your expenses, all of them. Property management. On a single-family home, you can expect to pay around 10%. If you see that it's 5% or 8%, that's probably a clue that either they don't, they're not good at what they do, therefore they're not confident, therefore they don't charge appropriately, or maybe they're not the ones doing the management and they're just trying to pad the numbers to make them look good. But on a single family home, you should allow for at least 10%. Me personally, I pay 15%. Managers told me 10. I said, give me, I'll pay you 15. Don't call me until the problem is solved. Don't nickel dime me to death. And that's worked really, really well for many, many years. Okay. Review the deal as if it's not turnkey. And by that, I mean, sometimes we put a lot of value on the fact that the property is turnkey and therefore ignore a lot of other issues. Well, I'm sure they've already thought about that. I mean, after all, it's turnkey. Well, your idea of turnkey and their idea of turnkey could be two completely different things. To me, turnkey means I don't have to do a damn thing except for cash checks. Well, a lot of folks, that's not the case. Well, it's turnkey, but you got to choose a paint color and landscaping. Or it's turnkey, but you got to find your own tenant. Oh, it's turnkey, but it needs a roof in six months. Well, that's not the time to find that out. If it needs a roof, it needs a roof now before it impacts your insurance, okay? Make sure that you thoroughly review all contracts and management agreements, okay? I can't begin to stress how important this is. Not that there's any hidden gobbledygook in there. Maybe there is sometimes. But what a lot of folks have a certain perception of reality. They think that things should be a certain way. Therefore, they would assume the contract would cover that. And in reality, it didn't, okay? The contracts are usually written by attorneys who... They try to prophesy and try to figure out what could come up in the future and cover it all, right? But a lot of times they're going to skip over things or maybe weird stuff happens. Bottom line is when it comes to management agreements and contracts, it should specify who pays for what and when, how maintenance things are taken care of. What is the procedure? What's the SOP? Do they get to a certain amount of levity every month? Can they spend up to 250 bucks a month without calling you? And if that's the case, go ahead and deduct that 250 now and see how your cash flow number lo- looks. If you don't like your cash flow number after seeing that $250 get sucked out anyway, then maybe you should take a second, step back and look at it and go, okay, well, maybe this isn't the right deal for me. Maybe I need to put different financing on it. Maybe I need to pay less for it. Maybe I need them to do more renovations up front. Like, for example, 
you've seen the pictures that the the water heater looks like you know it came from the the beginning days of Christ on Earth, and if that's the case, well, prehistoric water heaters can do one thing, and that's break and more importantly leak. And when they break and leak, number one, the tenant gets mad because they've got no hot water, and the floors get flooded. And if you got wood floors and drywall and all these crazy things, it can turn into a nightmare. So that's a very simple three hundred fifty four hundred dollar repair if done during the renovation, that could save thousands of dollars later. So if your deal is skinny, maybe you negotiate in the cost of a water heater replacement, or better yet, you have them replace the water heater so you start out fresh. Roof leak, same thing. Well, the roof's probably a good year or two. It's still got a good year or two. Yeah, that's great, right, until it leaks and then starts dripping all over the ceiling, and then the ceiling winds up on the floor, and the tenant gets mad and has to move out. Now you have vacancy loss. But don't worry, they told you that there's no more than 5% vacancy loss. In their analysis, you never bothered to run an analysis yourself to find out in Memphis, vacancy loss is more like 20%. And if you're not allowing for 20% vacancy loss in Memphis, you're going to get in deep trouble. Okay, Do not invest in Memphis unless you have at least 20%, or not at least, but I would figure 20% vacancy loss. A lot of you listening to this that are in Memphis going, no way, man. I'm here to tell you, I've owned a lot of property in Memphis different shapes and sizes and, and things, and I'm here to tell you, allow for the 20%. Here's the good news. If it turns out to be less than 20%, what does that mean? Two thumbs up, that means your money ahead. Okay, so be smart financially. Make sure these contracts specify how the money is divvied up. When that rent comes in, how it's divvied up, how expenses are approved, what the procedure is for the tenants to get a hold of the manager and not you. Wouldn't it suck for you if you bought a property turnkey? Next thing you know, a tenant's blowing up your text at 2 in the morning. And you're thinking, well, geez, why aren't they calling the, the property manager? Well, because the contract says that after 5 o'clock, the property managers don't bother. They, you have to deal with it. I've actually seen contracts that have this written in there. So make sure you read each line. And if you don't understand it, you need to seek understanding. And that means, for me, first ask the person that provided you the piece of paper. Second, if it's complex, if it's even remotely legal, Get an attorney involved, spend a couple hundred bucks, and ask their legal opinion, okay? That's the person who's going to help you in the event you have to enforce that contract, okay? Out of town investing, you know, the bottom line is you have to be confident in the abilities of that ready-made team because that's what you're doing with a turnkey investment. You have to be very, very confident that they are able to do what they can do and do it well. That said, I'm going to reiterate what I said earlier. You need to get on a plane. You know, these days, the days of Southwest Airlines, you can fly just about anywhere in the country for cheap, okay, a couple hundred bucks. And if you don't have a couple hundred bucks to invest as an insurance policy to get yourself over to the market, to look at the assets, to meet the managers, to shake hands with the maintenance guy and and have breakfast with the, the person that does the bookkeeping and all these different things. If you don't understand who that team is and you don't know them face with a name type of thing, you're going to have problems. You're going to be disappointed even if they don't necessarily do anything air quotes wrong, you're going to be disappointed because your expectations are going to be different than their expectations. And the only person's fault it will be if that's the case is yours because you did not do the extra little bit of work, a little bit of effort to double check and, and shake hands and be clear on expectations. And frankly, I would ask the question, what happens when the water heater blows at 2 a.m.? Can you walk me through the procedure? Who do they call? Well, they call us, the managers. Okay. And then do you call me at two in the morning to fix it or what, what's the steps? And there's no such thing as a stupid question. Ask those questions, be crystal clear on what the answers are. And if you don't like the answers, then maybe you should reconsider the deal. It's okay to say no, even though Terry Kerr being the guy he is great reputation, good dude company and bound for around for a long time. I'm sure there are times that tenants don't like Terry's team. And I'm sure there's times where, Owners get mad because they see a deduction on the, on the uh, cash flow statement. I'm sure all these things happen because all this is human nature. And no company is so good that they can predict how somebody's going to react six months or a year or 10 years down the road. That's why we spend time getting to know folks. Okay, So, folks, this also applies, by the way, in short distance or local investing. You should go through these same steps. You should physically meet in person, shake a hand with anybody that's going to deal with your money. That's the bottom line. You should get on a plane, unless you're over in England or Europe or wherever you are. You should get to know people. Go spend some time. One of the mistakes that we made when Jill and I first started investing in Memphis is that we skipped that step. I didn't go up to Memphis until I was already under contract on the first two buildings. 
And that was a problem because I got up there, I was under contract, and lo and behold, I was dumb enough to agree to a non-refundable deposit. Well, I can't say I didn't know any better. I did know better. I was just excited and being stupid. Lesson learned, I won't ever do that again. So I will say this, though, is that going up there and shaking hands with people made me realize that there was two management companies involved in the first two properties we bought up there. One managed one property, one managed the other, and these are both apartment buildings. One management company got fired immediately. At the closing table, I fired the one property management company and gave that building to the other property management company. The only way I was able to survive and make good money in Memphis and take good care of the buildings I have up there is because I trusted in the management company I wound up with. They're good people. J.D. Marks Real Estate, great people. I highly recommend them. Very good, honest, ethical people. Uh, They're not real super-duper technology-based, and that's fine for me because their integrity is worth a lot more than a fancy spreadsheet, in my opinion. That's just me. So, But still, even if you dealt with, went to Memphis and bought properties and you needed management, I would get on a plane, get in a car, go to Memphis, go sit down with Danny Quinn, go sit down with Miss Chill, the real estate agent there, and go talk to uh, Marshall and, and have lunch with these folks. And they're just good people. Salt of the earth. You're going to go do business with Terry Kerr. They need to get on the phone and go have breakfast with him. Go bring him a box of donuts and, and talk. Get to know these people because these are the folks that are going to control your financial future, have some control over it. So make sure that you are comfortable with them. Folks, I hope you got some value on this episode. I really hope you did. I want to make sure that you have the information you need to take things to the next level. If you get stuck, you get hung up, go to cashflowguys.com forward slash ask Tyler. I implore you to go there and give me the opportunity to help you get to the next level. If you don't take those steps to get help me, let me get you to the next level, well, then there's a pretty good chance you might not get there. I'm not the only game in town, but guys, ask the questions. I'm here to help you. Allow me to help you one more time. That's cashflowguys.com forward slash ask Tyler, cashflowguys.com forward slash ask Tyler. Guys, have a great week. Take some action. Do something different this week than you did last week towards getting to your financial future. We want to see you get financially free. Part of that is because I don't want to support you. So hope you guys have a great week. See you next time. This concludes today's episode. You don't have to wait till the next episode to learn to earn. Head over to CashflowGuys.com and contact Tyler and his team for more powerful tips and ideas. So you can start generating multiple streams of income and escape the rat race.